live streaming is on. Hello, Global Theater. My name is Jerry Fialka. Today is October 29, 2021. We want to thank Clinton Ignatov of Concern Medicine. Thank you so much, Clinton. I sure hope you return with a killer question at the end there. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with Jonathan Feinberg. Is that the correct way to pronounce it? That's exactly right. Jonathan, where are you calling from? I live in the town of Lincoln, Massachusetts, which is a short bike ride away from Walden Pond, that part of the world. Oh, how cool. First question is, what's the best thing for a human being? Hmm. <laughs> Boy, does that change as you get older. <laughs> uh, I think that meaningful work, uh, meaningful that, you know, it, that actually uh, does something for other people. And that can be either, uh, well, so in my, my professional life, I, I work at Google where I'm a manager and uh, that's become very meaningful. Uh, surprisingly, when I was younger, I had no, no thought of doing that. Uh, but it's the way you can make a big difference in the lives of the people who report to you. And as a songwriter, I feel like uh, that's an opportunity to mean something to people, too. And it's, it's as much for myself as for them, of, of course, if not more so as a, as a discipline or a practice. But um, those things for me, those, those make my life good. Of course, I'm also a father and a husband. Um, and, and those things are, give me a very full life. Well articulated. Thank you so much. What's your favorite form of information? How it comes into you? Mm. For the past few years, uh, audiobooks. Audiobooks. All mm -hmm. right. I don't know if that. I don't know if information is the right word. Uh, information in the rather abstract sense of of <laughs> things that that change what you know or or feel. But yeah. Why do you think humans collect or gather information? I only know why I do, and it's. Uh, I, I work at Google, so I really ought to know the answer to that question because that's that's our mission statement: is to organize and make accessible the world's information. Uh, I do it out of curiosity. I I want to know things. Um, sometimes it's pragmatic. I I want to know how to restart my goddamned computer, uh, but often it's just like I really want to understand things. So I I don't know. I can't speak for anyone else though. Beautiful and. Jonathan, just keep in mind, a lot of my questions are sort of general and um, they could be taken different ways and you put them into the context you want. So if I say, do humans do this? Yeah, I know you're answering as you observe humans and you are a human. So it's really we're after your hunch, your guess, your intuition. But you, it, this is fine. Um, do you think this need or want to collect or gather information is more innate or more invented? I have no way of knowing my own milieu growing up in this world is I, I, I'm my own desires are so informed by the world I grew up in, which is very information dense and increasingly from the time I was a kid, information available. So I always dug libraries when I was a kid and I spent I spent a lot of time in there and museums. Um, and, you know, now we have this box in front of us at this moment that is seductive in that way that it, it appears to provide some of that same uh, gas, that same juice. I don't know if it does, but um, I don't know. It seems to be innate in me, that's for sure. And I have actually wasted time wondering what the hell I would have done if I'd grown up in a different time. I, I really don't know, maybe a mathematician. Yeah. It was good. Um, do thoughts create emotions? No, I don't think so. I think they can. In humans, they can. They can. But I think I think in actual day to day uh, interaction and in being in the world, I think emotions are are primal first. Uh, and then we often, I think, construct narratives about why we have a feeling. I don't think they're correct. I, I mm. having read a lot of like Robert Sapolsky and and other uh, behavioral psychologists and neuroscientists, I, I feel strongly that uh, the feeling is is entirely separate from thought. Humans are distinct in that we can think about, we can 
have a, a, a process that is us thinking about what's going to happen next week and having a feeling about that. I don't think other animals can do that. So yes, you can think about things and trigger emotions. I think most of the emotions we feel are like, we don't have any idea where they're coming from or why. And the, and the happiest people are those who can uh, 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 pay less attention to them or, or disbelieve them a little bit. I'm not one of those people, <laughs> but the, the, those are the happy people. Jonathan, well put. Thank you. Is thinking more innate or more invented? I think thinking is is too general a word to answer. I, I think that problem solving is innate, uh, you know, figuring stuff out. But I think that uh, r reading an essay and then writing about it is invented. I, that that surely is a cultural invention because we've been the same species for a hundred thousand years, but we've only been doing that for five thousand, ten thousand, right? So um, that's invented. But surely, cogitating, figuring stuff out, problem solving, planning those those are innate. I think it's good. I don't know what I think until I fill in the blank. Have a conversation with someone I trust. Whoa, that was good. Can humans think without language? Uh, probably, but I don't know what it would mean. I think it's a it's a little like asking, "Do animals think?" Here's my here's my dog, Milo. Right. <laughs> what what timing he came in? <laughs> right at that. Yeah. I, I I surely something must happen, even in the absence of language that we we'd have to call thinking because that's what brains do but i don't know what it yeah. would mean or how it would work yeah chomsky says the interesting thing he says that a language is not whoops just words it's a culture it's a tradition it's a mm. unification of community a whole history that creates what a community is jonathan what do you do when uh, when language doesn't work when language breaks down what do you do <laughs> I, uh, hmm. <laughs> right, well, so I guess I need to think about like, what, what is a situation in which that might happen? So there could be a, an emotionally heated conversation where words only seem to be making things worse. Um, and honestly, I don't know. I think in general, the, the, the question is like, what do we need to get out of this situation? Um, I think I rely on language, frankly. I, uh, you know, yeah. as a musician, I know how to make uh, sounds that are in some way meaningful or quasi meaningful. Um, but not really. I can't get out of a, a, an emotionally difficult conversation by. <laughs> that's not, that's not gonna happen. Uh, so honestly, I don't really have a way. I really rely heavily on language. Yeah, no, that was good. Uh, just your observations of humans. Are humans more feeling beings or more thinking beings? I think so. I know it's both in it. Depends. No, I 100% I we're, we're emotional, irrational beings. And then yeah. we, we construct stories about why we do things and uh, why we did things, and I think they're all bullshit. <laughs> I, I, think, I think we're uh, entirely irrational beings. You know, we know how to exploit rationality to to make ourselves uh, safer, to make money, and all, and all that stuff. That's that's great. Those are good tools for us. But I I think we are animals. Wow, very good. Turing asked two questions in nineteen fifties. Mm. Is thinking a function of the soul? I don't believe in the soul. It depends on what you mean by the soul, but I don't believe in anything extra physical. Yeah. Can machines think? Again, the word think is so sloppy and loose and uh, has so many connotations. I think... So it to me, thinking the way you're probably using the word is embodied and is tied in with, yeah. with all these other processes that um, are exactly what I was talking about, like these feelings and these reactions and behaviors that uh, 
the thinking is a is a layer on top of that we make stories up about why we did things. So in that sense, no, I don't think so. Uh, I, but they can certainly do a lot of the things that we do with thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. As someone who actually knows a little something about machine learning, I can tell you it is amazing. And it's so deep, in fact, that um, <laughs> these systems that we initially developed as a research effort to understand human consciousness are now, in fact, so complicated that we have people getting PhDs in order to figure out how machine learning works, like empirically. Like we know what we did to cause this to happen, but we don't really understand the model that's been built or why it works the way it does. So I know someone who just got his PhD in trying to visualize and understand how machine brains work. So they'll have to build another model for that. Um, so, yeah. No, that was good, Jonathan. That was very good because, you know, my quest in, in doing these questions 35, 40 years is I'm always after different wording or mm. the person rewording the question to clarify it more. So you changing that to embodied was beautiful. Mm. You know, can machines think and embody? Do you more pursue happiness or more pursue meaning? I I think I might actually have set myself up for this question with the first answer. I don't I don't know how to distinguish the two anymore. I feel like the the more meaningful my actions, the happier I am. It seem they seem yeah. to be together. On, on the other hand, I, I'm also older than I used to be, and I think uh, there's some kind of uh, mellowing that happens with age that I'm really benefiting from. I am so sorry. My dog is is barking to be let out. I will let him out. And then I'll no, run. no, that's a, bro, no worries at all. <laughs> what? We just want to remind listeners they they can uh, check out Jonathan Feinberg's wonderful website and pursue listening to his music and things he's done as a software engineer as a computer programmer and his career as a drummer and now he's pursuing more songwriting as a lyricist in fact a very witty lyricist and so uh remind viewers Sorry, man. that very good i just okay. got to, to plug some of your um great accomplishments oh, and <laughs> onward and upward does the brain more detect consciousness or create consciousness mm. consciousness they're bubbling away and we're detecting it or are we actually creating it? in my opinion consciousness is a process of the brain so i guess create kind of yeah. but it, it rather i mean there's that word embody again it's where consciousness happens yeah i don't know if like i don't think that the brain creates it in the sense that there's some part of the brain that decides to have some consciousness now it's just the thing that the brain does yeah. <laughs> That's what they do. What's faster, speed of light or speed of thought? <laughs> Unfortunately, you're talking to a, a fairly literal person who knows a lot about physics, so I'm going to have to go with speed of light. You can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. That's Audre Lord. Yvonne Rayner responded to her and said, you can if you expose the tools. What new tool do you suggest? Hold on. I have to rewind this. You yeah. can't D dismantle. You can't yeah. dismantle the master's house with the using master's using the tool. master's tools. Honestly, I don't know what that means. Yeah. What does that well, mean? Yeah, that's very interesting because the basic question. Now, a lot of my questions I set up with these cute quotes. They don't have to correspond to the question. So the basic question is, is what new tool do you suggest? What new tool do you use? But you can't dismantle the master's house, meaning who controls you? What, mm. you know, whether it's physically, it's sort of like Frank Zapp asking, who are the brain police? <laughs> are the brain police, these consumer culture, uh, uh, you know, corporations that are, you know, create the disease and offer the cure? Or is the, are the brain police inside each human themselves? Yeah. They're deciding what decisions to make. So yeah. again, it, it's it's open to a lot of interpretation. I'm glad you challenged it because the master's house is a metaphor. 
And, you know, if you want to uh, dismantle something that's controlling you. Yeah, I love it. Can, can you use the same tool? Can you do it from inside the system? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In fact, yeah. I mean, bringing up Frank was incredible because Frank said the only way you're going to change the system is work within the system. You know? Yeah. I mean, there is, in a sense, you, you, depending on where you see the boundaries of the system, there is no getting out of it. It's the matrix, yeah, yeah. right? Um, yeah. I, uh, wow. So I, I'll tell you the things I know how to do and then I, the things that I know works that I, that I still don't do. The thing that I know works based on my friend's reports of it is meditation is the way. Yeah. Which is, and I'm, I mean, so yes, I don't have a regu uh, regular meditation practice, but I do have experience with mindfulness and uh back when i was doing a lot of therapy i remember th how frustrating it was to be told that your main tool is simply to be simply to be and to and to <laughs> go, and to notice and to acknowledge what the reality of whatever's going on inside you with your thoughts and blah 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 that you can't use force to to um to stop that process but I also know that there's like there's drugs, alcohol, like that stuff is, is actually great. It's useful, uh, but its usefulness is limited and it's dangerous because it comes with a lot of other stuff that that, uh, you know, the inability to make things that you want to make and to do things you want to do. Uh, sleepiness, stupidity, um, burnout. But those things can happen through work, too. So, yeah, drugs and alcohol. Exercise is good. Those that's a way to disrupt the the garbage. But um yeah. I don't know. No, I would say you answered it well. Two tools that you could suggest are meditation and exercise. Yeah, mindfulness and exercise. Mindfulness. Yeah. I like that word. Yeah. Yeah. Which is about letting go of trying to to change things and more about simply being aware and seeing where that gets you. What do you worry about when you go to bed at night? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> I worry about I worry about um, whether I'm a good parent. I worry about whether I'm good at my job. Uh, I worry about climate. I worry about um, how my kids are going to do in this world that I don't recognize. Um, I worry about our country and how just fucking insane the situation is now. I, you know, I, I was just remembering that I, I used to wonder what it was like to live in one of those countries. To live in a place where uh, there's a dictator taking over, to live in a place that's uh, to live in de the 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 declining days of Rome, you know the things yeah. you read about as a kid. And now we know it's like this. It's a drag. So <laughs> I think about all those things. Yeah. Yeah. McLuhan learned from Ezra Pound, the poet, that artists are the antenna of the race. Mm. They're broadcasting and detect detecting the hidden psychic effects of our inventions. Mm. So we don't know how the internet has changed us really. A couple people a couple people have studied it mm -hmm. deeper. Mm -hmm. You know that in just your profession. But you know, we embrace our in, our inventions and you know, we shape our tools and they shape us. But and then Pound's main thing was so that you look to the artists to reveal these hidden psychic effects so that you can learn to cope with what you don't like about them. So McLuhan's main thing was, why do we still ignore the hidden psychic effects of our inventions, even though the artists reveal them to us? I think it's actually related to my last answer where I mentioned drugs. Yeah. I think that um, those aspects of the internet that I, I think you're getting at, or, or at least the things that I think of when you talk about the potential yeah harm uh are are essentially the same as drugs that yeah. there's a uh the constant feed the uh upvote downvote um partial reinforcement schedule of social networks um i i think about facebook a lot uh it's a catastrophe for the world like they gave us a lot of this dystopia that i've been talking about um, and yet, if it weren't for Facebook, I don't know how I would have become a songwriter in the past few years. Wow. I don't know how I would have connected with those people who I already knew, but who who came to mean something different to me as uh, 
uh, people I can engage in uh, uh, peer critique with rather than I'm their yeah. side man, right? Like I became, I, I moved to a different level as a musician, I think. Oh. Um, and I don't, I just don't know how that would have happened without Facebook or something equivalent to it. Yeah. Maybe, you know, it would be lovely to have a thing that that's that part of Facebook without them pushing toxic nonsense uh, and, and disinformation. So, All right. But Jonathan, you really, said it well because the way we connected was through my wife Susie Williams. Yeah, right, right, right. We you wouldn't be doing this. Yeah. As songwriters. Yeah. And yeah. it was beautiful. And I just said, hey, I want to interview this guy after she played <laughs> that witty song to me. And Elma said, I was like, this is so two things that it resonated with your answer was McLuhan said word is the most addicting and universal drug. So you know what you did was something he leans towards is everything humans and men have both services and disservices. So then you uh -huh. started telling me a service of Facebook and uh -huh. a disservice. So then you suss that you, that's like the big picture, comprehensive awareness. Very good. Are you more afraid of old ideas or more afraid of new ideas? I don't know that there are any new ideas. I think uh, the, all the shitty, scary stuff that's happening now is real old stuff. <laughs> and it has to do with how shitty humans are. So I don't know if there are new ideas. I like, uh, uh, am I afraid? No, I'm not afraid of n new versus old. Um, no, new is exciting. Uh, new in art. It, it, like again, it, it's hard to actually come up with anything that hasn't already been done. Like I personally, I write antique songs. I write songs that are antique in form, uh, that are meant to stimulate uh, a, a racial or, or uh, a memory, a human memory of a of a musical form or a time, and then maybe tweak it a little bit to, to amuse you uh, or to move you. Uh, there are many people who who create new music but of course they're using guitars and drums right they're not they're not you, you how are you going to make an entirely new sound so um i don't know if i believe that there is such a thing as a, a an actually yeah. new idea it's beautiful well put in um susie did want to relay a, a, a idea to you is she just got these two words today somewhere and said tell jonathan i want to write a song with them called cliche alert <laughs> <laughs> And I says, well, you got to read Marshall's book from from cliche to archetype, because we have what we do is we take cliches and when we turn them into archetypes. So anyway, that 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 really captures exactly what I was trying to say about uh, the way I, I many of the songs I write, I think are. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. right. I mean, they move from a cliche, which basically cliche change the root of the word wasn't something negative mm. you know it, it connotates the word negative is not quite it but it doesn't connotate you know something good well I, you it. use it to, to mean you didn't work very hard to come up with what you just did right. that's something that's right. available right it's, it's yeah vulgar right. yeah but archetype is like oh we like archetypes <laughs> <laughs> oh oh so part of from cliche to architect type is not describing a change of the meme itself from one to another, but rather the 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 frame that you put an idea in. Dude, you just nailed it. I mean, McLuhan was all about form and content, but people think he was just emphasizing form. Hmm. But because we're so content focused, he said, let's pay a little attention to form because you generally don't, you know. And you, you know, anyways. Can you conjure up your earliest memory ever or <laughs> one of them? <laughs> In fact, yes. I remember a man who my parents had hired to take care of me, a babysitter slash housekeeper, when I was four and a half or five. Uh, and I remember that he played the flute and I remember that he was 
Asian in feature. And I remember being told that he was Korean, but I don't, I wouldn't actually directly remember that about him. So yes, I remember him for whatever reason. And I also, yeah. Yeah, that, that's beautiful because you know how how many uh, first memories are not auditory, they're visual. Ninety mm. percent of people answer with "I saw the light in my crib" or "My I saw the steps on the back porch" or yeah. you know. So I mean, you said a visual, but you I remember seeing, but you also implied that you must have heard the flute. I, yeah, I remember watching him play it and being fascinated. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I also have very, very early memories of listening to the Beatles at my grandfather, my mother's father's house, who had a copy of Revolver. And I remember I have a pre-linguistic memory of the lyrics of the song um, For No One. Uh your day breaks, your mind aches You find that all your words of kindness linger on When she no longer needs you So I, I would listen to that song um, I didn't know what it was about But I heard that line about She no longer needs you And I remember visualizing um, cheese In particular American cheese The kind that comes in a, a little package That you have to peel the plastic off of so I knew that it was sad. It felt sad to me. And I knew that it was about cheese. And that was when I was probably <laughs> two, three years old. I, rem I remember listening to that music and loving it. And I'm told that I called the Beatles the Boo Jews. <laughs> I want to hear the Boo Jews. That is great. Is memory more a curse or more a blessing? Hmm. Uh, Robert's, uh, and Oliver Sacks, rather, he, he dealt with... Um, how do you separate memory from identity? And there was also uh, something I either read or listened to recently that dealt with people who had a weird kind of amnesia that only lasts for a little while, a day, a few hours. And what happens with people when they're in that situation, I, I'm getting to an answer, is that they get into a loop in conversations. They have no memory of how they got there. And they are talking to their husband or wife or whatever. And they say, wow, like everyone, I, I keep, I, what is this place? Oh, it's a hospital. How did I get here? Ba -da -da. And there are recordings of these people having literally the same reactions to the same information, like, huh, like the same gestures, the same sounds, every, like precisely the same over and over again for hours because they forgot that they've had it. But the reactions are show us to be something of an automaton without memory so i think memory you were asked whether it's a curse or a blessing yeah i it it, 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 it that depends on whether you are a curse or a blessing <laughs> you well, there is there is no identity without memory i don't think and that could be a curse i suppose but i think i think memory is a blessing i'm gonna go with yeah. blessing Tell me an early role model, someone who had an impact on you within your immediate family. And the second part is outside your immediate family. And what specifically was that impact? Just briefly. My uh, father's father, Philip Feinberg, um, was extremely important. They both were uh, poppy, as I called him, and nanny. But he intellectually was, was my role model and still is. He's long dead. And I miss him every day. He uh, was a microscopist and a photographer and um, a maker of things. And th his attitude towards the world, his curiosity, his knowledge, uh, and his willingness to, to share that with me and to be excited about those things with me it was by far the most profound influence in my life from someone in my family. Beautiful. Outside your immediate family. Hmm. I think of a couple answers. There was a um, a group of friends I had around senior year of high school who turned me on to the Beach Boys, who kind of reintroduced me to the Beatles. 
and many, many other uh, m- musical kind of cultural touchstones. Uh, they were into like a lot of uh, Chicago producers, Steve Albini, long before he became a, a household name like Big Black. And they, he, these are people who just, they hung around, uh, listened to interesting and important music, talked about it and cared about it. And they kind of, and actually uh, we put on a play together that we wrote and produced. So they were like the first real group of artists, art lovers, um, people who lived and breathed art. And in fact, I believe that the father of two of two of the kids who were brothers was a theater director in, in uh, Chicago. So it was that kind of community. So that had a huge impact on me. And actually, this one drum teacher I had when I was 17, uh, his name is Freddie White from the band Earth, Wind & Fire, the drummer in Earth, Wind & Fire. My mom met him at a recording session. She was a jingle writer. And uh, she said, oh, my son plays drums, (laughs) which is what Jewish mothers do. And he taught me that summer. He gave me lessons. And that was, it really turned my head around. After, at the time, I remember being very, very concerned with, am I going to, am I good enough to be a professional drummer? I was really worried about that. Like, am I good enough? um, Yeah, do I measure up? However you want to put it. And he was the guy, I mean, I remember the things he taught me as a, as a player, but I also remember his attitude was like, that's the wrong question. You have no wow. business thinking about that. That has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> he was really, he wasn't angry that way, but he was really adamant. Like that is you, so beside the point of what we're doing here. And that had a huge impact on me. And I remember he taught me how to hit the hi-hat. And how to hit the snare drum. We didn't do a lot of technical stuff like exercises for coordination. He was just like, here's how you pull the sound out of this instrument. And so those things really, as a musician, had a lasting, lasting impact on me. Beautiful. Yeah, BSP, because you anticipated the next question. <laughs> did your parents raise you a particular religion? Mm. And the follow-up is, did you ever check out or are you still practicing? Um, yes to both. I was raised as a uh, reform Jew in a reform Jewish community. I was bar mitzvahed and almost immediately after my bar mitzvah, I dropped out entirely. I literally, the reason I know that it's Hanukkah these days is because my kids who aren't Jewish, um, come home with a menorah from school, <laughs> you know, like, Oh, it must be, must be Hanukkah. I can teach you the prayer. I don't believe in any of that stuff myself, but, um, yeah. So yes, I would. I and I cherish uh, culturally like all the Jewish stuff. I love. I just this morning I took a pictures of my uh, 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 an Instagram picture of my bagels and lox. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I and I love you know culturally the um, the kind of uh, I don't know attitude affect of of a Jewish family. Like I love I love yeah. uh, that whole thing. Um, so yeah, I have nothing against Judaism culturally or anything like that, but I, I have no stomach for um, religion, for God, I, none of that stuff. Do you pray? I do not. If God exists, what do you want God to say to you after you die? That's a Bernard Pivot question. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, there's a TV show that used to be on uh, inside the actor's studio, and uh, uh, James, oh, James? Lynn would end every interview with uh, these are five questions from Bernard Pivot. And one of them was, if, when you, after you, I, I must have got it from him. Is Bernard's <laughs> last name, how do you spell that? Last I would name? guess it's P I V O T. That's wild. I <laughs> must have got it from him. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, if God exists, what do I want him? Oh, I I want him to say, um, you did okay. You did all right. You know, my, my worry in life is, uh, have I been a good father? Right. Like, so if he, if he were to tell me you did okay, that would mean a lot to me. (laughs) 
Beautiful. And thank you for sourcing out my questions. I, I've collected them for so many years and I try to remember where I got them, but that is good. I'm enjoying them. I, I it, it came out like I really thought we'd be talking about my work or that you'd be asking me, like, who, who, what, who are you? What do you do? But it's just like, OK, let's let's go do this. Yeah, this other thing. yeah no. It, 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 again, you put them in the context you want. Do evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? <sighs> I think that our minds are susceptible to evil and that much like a brain is a thing that thinks, I think that humanity is a thing that has evil, that, that evil is uh, a system that benefits a few at the expense of many and yet that exploits these brains and many of the people who are suffering under evil to support it. And, uh, you know, I, and I'm talking, of course, about fascism and genocide. And, like, there's there's something wrong with the design of our brains, design, the way our brains work. And it takes so little to to push so many into that. So I think that, I think that, I think that systems theory would say evil exists and that it creates evil people. Yeah. Wow, that was good. Thank you so much. And um, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? This one I'm going to set up with a few modern thinkers thoughts. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Mm -hmm. Cop Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close mm -hmm. and your enemies close. Yeah. JFK said, forgive your enemy, but don't forget their name. And Fellini says, I need an enemy. So it's a lot of thoughts. The basic, <laughs> the basic question is, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But first, how would you react to the Alan Watts? If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Yeah, yeah. I That sounds right to me. I'm, I'm, I'm spending a moment trying to frame my own experience uh, such that I can find someone I could consider an enemy to consider the question. I don't know that I've ever, since I was a kid, where there were bullies or whatnot, I don't believe I've ever had anyone who was out to get me or who wanted me not to succeed, which is what I like. I think of an enemy who wants, as someone who wants something that you are in the way of, and they're going to do whatever they have to do to get it. And I don't, I don't think I've ever been in that situation. So I don't know if I've ever actually had an enemy. But let's think back to when there were a couple of bullies at school who really resented me for my whatever, you know, uh, wealth, um, apparent uh, happiness. And I certainly had no lack of family or material wealth, right? And these were kids who had tough homes. Um, I wasn't thinking of it this way at the time. So they were kind of my enemy. And I don't think that not acknowledging them helped. I, like, that just... I guess I would have to know what Alan Watts meant, and it's hard for me to relate to. Yeah, no, no, it's it's interesting because people go, if you don't acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. But just in general, I, I appreciate what you're saying, too. When just say one of your kids come home and they, there's a conflict with yeah. another human and yeah. you could say, well, that person's like, it's, it's amazing. The word enemy has often been put in context recently as bully, you know, and they say, Hey, I'm a bull there's a bully at school. How would you advise your child to deal with? Oof, that's tough. That is that is like one of the hardest problems, I think. Um, well, probably the first thing I would do is uh, I would try to remember to first uh, acknowledge the kid's experience, our kid's experience, and tell him that he's safe here before I start trying to tease out actually what happened. Um, 
like were you were you pushing uh, emotionally pushing this person are you in any way in their face uh that doesn't excuse any violence but you know just we need to know to understand i don't know i think i would you know call in the classroom teacher and say can we understand the situation yeah honestly no uh, it's back to your that's, that's a tough one it's back to you saying uh, you encourage live dialogue you know to suss something yeah out. well there's words again yeah definitely words are the only um tool i have the master's tool <laughs> <laughs> james joyce was the first projectionist in dublin over 100 years ago he basically checked out he said this is stupid why should i go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when i can go outside and see a real tree <laughs> years later faulkner said sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism yes why do we why do we have to recreate things in order to get them why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life why don't we just live life well for one thing when you're in the middle of living it uh you're um you're invested in getting something um changing something you need something someone else needs something you're negotiating i don't think that um those are good situations for reflection because you're really in it i think in a work of art I, for me composing a song i just wrote a song last night um that i've been trying to write for two months in fact susie heard a very very early version of a chunk of that song when we had a songwriters workshop like a long time, a couple months ago. Um, and I finally wrote it last night. And uh, it's a song about a father and a son. But it's not, I'm not that father. And my son is not that son. But there's no way I could have written it without those experiences. And um, I think that I learned, even by writing that song, let alone, you know, with, if someone hears it, They'll have feelings, uh, but I learned something from it. So um, I think art is, uh, it's like, it's like, um, you know, Plato, the, the parable of the cave. Uh, we have virtual reality now. It's the same kind of thing. And I think that if you put on a play, you are uh, manipulating, in a sense, people's minds. You are giving them ex real human experiences of things that can really happen to people um, safely. Uh, you, you, are, you are tricking their minds into having experiences that are just like the real experiences they would have, but they, you can heighten them uh, in, however you want. You can emphasize certain things. You can... Um, you can uh, obscure other things and you can create tension and you can release tension and those things create pleasure um and you know what you know charles eames said who who is to say that pleasure is not useful so uh all those things together are why we do that like you there's nothing wrong with life like living life that's good but there's also it's really valuable to have art as well Really well put. So, Jonathan, that leads right into your sort of pursuits, your careers, um, one being a computer engineer, software engineer, mm -hmm. computer programmer, yep. and the other one being a drummer and a songwriter. That's right. So, yeah. So um, would you say um, you, you sort of touch on the Beatles and the Beach Boys and your 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 core community group creating theater? Where, when in your life did you kick over and say, I can be a drummer? Like, what sort of kicked you over? And then what sort of kicked you over to saying, I can be a computer engineer? And then what kicked you over into saying, I can be a songwriter? Hmm. You know, those three mm -hmm. main things, just sort of those, the tipping point kind of moments. The first one you ask about, when did it tip over and I... I became a drummer i thought i can be a drummer actually never happened i think i was always very very fearful um about my 
ability to make, make enough money to live. Um, and I also did not enjoy a lot of the work you have to do unless you're one of the very few, very lucky people who like hits it really big with a band. Um, <laughs> I didn't enjoy that kind of work. I didn't like, I didn't, I played one wedding when I was in music school and I just hated it. I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, I, I did a Broadway show as a drummer. I, I was a sub on a Broadway show, but I played hundreds of performances and uh, I liked that, but I didn't, I didn't want to do that for a living forever. So I, 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 and I could have, I could have done what you asked about and I could have had a tipping point. Um, but there's something about me that, it, that just didn't happen. And I was always on the fence. I was, and there was a lot of on the fenceness in my life. I was on the fence with particular bands I was into. I really want to be in this band. I don't know. I was on the fence with what career I had. And so I was freelance computer programming. I was doing some drumming. The money that I needed to live came in trickles from music and in larger floods from computer programming because people are willing to pay much more for that in general. Um, so it didn't happen. Um, computer programming was from the time I was a pretty small boy, I happened to grow up in kind of a golden age of accessibility to uh, access to programmable machines. The library had one, a friend of mine had one, eventually I had one or two, the, these little tiny computers you'd bring home. But I, at that time, the only way to use them was to write programs on them. There, there was, you could, there were some games and stuff and maybe a spreadsheet, but really they were machines for programming. And I just loved it from that early age. When I was in college, I my senior year took the introduction to CS class, which was, you know, too late, but it blew my mind and it gave names to concepts I had kind of stumbled upon on my own. And then in New York, living with a, another theater company and doing this and that, I had some money and I studied some more computer programming at continuing ed at NYU and eh. At some point, I just started getting work. Yeah. A big flip came when uh, my first son was born. We were living in New York, and there was some genetic switch that turned off on me. And I was like, I, I got to get a career. Like this, being a musician and working at a startup and all this stuff isn't isn't going to do it for me. And just through social contacts, I got very, very lucky, and I got a good job uh, at IBM in Cambridge. And it just happened. Like we, it, that switch just kind of flipped itself. Yeah. The songwriting. Uh, so let's see. I've always been a multi instrumentalist. I've always been able to play drums, guitar, piano. Um, and I've always been fascinated by the construction of songs. And so I've always recorded covers to whatever extent I could. But uh, really, the most important development has been technology. I now I'm sitting next to, here, I'll show you this box um, right here this box here so this box right here and this box here and this box here um <laughs> those those things uh make it possible uh with a little good taste and a couple of good mics to um you can basically get about 80 percent of the quality of a real recording studio for less than one percent of the price of a real yeah. recording studio. and so i was able to push a little harder on my pleasure and recreating songs kind of as production etudes. I just like, I would listen to a Beatles song. Like, how do you, how can I make that sound? It's just a, yeah. a bodily need I have to do. So I started doing that and I shared a couple of them on Facebook. I'd mentioned Facebook before and people responded nicely. I, I was, a, I was a little bit nervous about my voice, my singing. Uh, I shared a few more and I started going well, and I don't know where it came from, but I had the idea to do a project called um, uh, Coverage, where I solicited song requests on Facebook, uh, and I asked for two things from each person, a, a, so a, a song you want me to do, and it has to be one that you unironically love. No, you can't just give me one because you think it'll be hard and funny to watch me fail. No, it has to be a song you actually love, and I would like, please, a constraint of some kind. Um, and I'm sure I don't have to explain to you the value of constraints in art making. Um, but uh, being married to an art 
professor and um, having seen the five obstructions and having thought a lot about how the Beatles worked and all that stuff, I knew that I know that constraints are, are crucial. And I didn't really know how critical they are, but like they gave me everything. It, it's such a liberation to have uh, something like that. Yeah. That you don't have to solve all the problems in the world. You only have to solve this one problem. Um, so anyway, that project was that totally changed my life. Like everything about it was great. The interactions I had with people actually making the work and frankly, the response I got from people, which was so uh, validating and uh, encouraging. I got to the end of that about a year later and immediately had the idea to do a project where I solicit ideas for writing songs. Yeah. But I wasn't a songwriter. I didn't know if I could follow through on that. And I put that idea away and I got increasingly depressed. I was having a really rough time. I had nothing meaningful going on. And one day during a walk, I remembered that idea again. And I felt so happy just having that memory. I was like, oh, I got to follow that. No matter how risky it is, no matter. I don't have any reason to believe I could succeed at that other than that this project I just did. And I just, I, I did it. I just like put myself out there and I said, please give me ideas for songs. And I never, I never said, I don't really know what I'm doing. I was like, nope, this is, I'm doing this. I'm going to write these songs. You give me the idea for the song, I'll give you a song. And around that time, just stuff started happening. I got involved in this Brown University uh, alumni thing where uh, there, there was a, a big collection of little mini musicals all edited into one piece called together apart and i was asked to write a song for that uh okay yeah sure i'll write a song for that i figured that'll be easy like i, there, I there's characters they've got a script already uh there's going to be some problem that they need to solve like there's a beginning and i knew i know about all that stuff i know about how to write a scene because i've read books and whatever i can do that whatever someone else in that project asked me to produce their track okay i know how to do that i produce all day um and just that first song, I just I sat down and I wrote it. And I was like, okay, I can write it. I wrote that. That was easy. Um, and it just kept happening. Like, I I just, I kept, without looking too closely at it and without worrying too much about it, I was just like, okay, I'm just going to do this now. And I just kept doing this now. And they were coming out pretty good. So I I just, that's how it happened. That's a that very, was, very long answer. No, that was really good because it helped. It leads into this perfectly, Jonathan. A screenwriting teacher told me a great film or great art, great music is when you can clearly see the intention of the maker. Kubrick oh, yeah. says the opposite. Great art is when you can clearly not see the intention of the maker. I think T.S. Eliot was on Team Kubrick. Yeah, there you go. What role does intention play in your creative process? Mine. Uh, it is the whole thing. And and it's the reason these, these uh, projects are so valuable to me is because they take a lot of that work out of the process. I've given... Uh, 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 an idea, uh, uh, an intention, right? I, I get that. I don't have to solve that problem anymore. I know kind of what the song is about. Um, then it's just a question of, it's almost like uh, trying to find something that's already there. Um, so I would say that the intention is 100% of everything. It's, it's the whole, like they say in acting that listening is everything. And I think that um, in songwriting, it's kind of similar. You're you're listening to and reacting to uh, the idea that, that you want to express. It can be indirect, really? but yeah. yeah. Really good. Duchamp said there's no art without an audience. How much are you thinking of your listener when you're writing your song? I think that when it's going well, I'm not at all. I think I, I'm really being true to some almost, there's like an archetypal that's the song i'm trying to write is there i'm not thinking about the people who are going to listen believe me i think about them a lot after i've put it out there and i wonder what's it like to listen to my song what do they think when they like do they feel it? do they think it's funny do they think it's sad um but in the it, when it's when i'm in the, the the pleasure of the creation of the thing uh zero nothing at all i'm really searching for the thing itself McLuhan says everything we invent extends some humanness. So uh, 
clothing could be extension of our skin knife and fork oh. extends our teeth mm. you know whatever philosophy extends something some humanness what does the piano extend for mm. you mm. what hu what humanness yeah. yeah it's a good question especially because like i have choices for instruments to write on there's piano mm. and there's the guitars behind me and uh, or i mean theoretically you could just sit and think a song up yeah. but um uh, and I have written songs on guitar. Uh, the piano gives you, gives me as someone who hasn't mastered as much of the guitar, it gives me a much broader palette, a huge vocabulary of uh, ideas, emotions, um, uh, movement. Like there's things I simply know how to do that allow me to think much more freely. On the other hand, uh, it comes with a limitation, which is that, um, I mean, I'm not unlimited as a pianist. I'm, I'm, I'm very limited. So I have a, a fairly sophisticated music theoretical knowledge that I can apply to my piano playing, but I don't have a lot of facility. I can't solo. I can't comp with my left hand and play. You know, I can't do that stuff. But I can, I know that when I want that sound, I know how to get it. I know how to get this sound. You know, I know how to do those things. But the thing is that the genre that come with those sounds are of a particular age. So that's why I wind up writing antique songs. And it doesn't bother me yet. And it, it hasn't limited me yet. Um, but it, it's something I'm, I feel aware of. And that uh, I, hopefully the song I wrote last night uh, will begin to break out of that mold a bit. I think it's my first truly original um, piece. Like the first truly original piece of music that actually sounds that doesn't sound like some other genre so we'll see yeah very good uh my friend calls uh talks about the three tenets of music t's taste technique and theory mm -hmm. so you learn how to play the keyboard you know what you're doing the technique you know how to do it the theory is what you're doing how does one acquire taste <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I wouldn't. It would be a little arrogant to say I have good taste and here's how I got it. I certainly have taste. I have, you know, uh, I, in a sense, I feel like I was uh, born with a propensity, let's say, and that I was lucky enough to have it tickled in the right way at the right time. So I, I described listening to the Beatles at my mother's father's house. And uh, that like at that very early age, there was something about that. that was like, this is it. This is, this is the thing that I, uh, that I relate to this song about American cheese slices. Um, well, that's good. Let's go. On. What's, yeah, more, what's more fundamental language or music? I know that um, Bernstein thought that music was. I don't know though. That's that's all right. I think music is is uh, can be more powerful, but I think that language is more likely to get you fed. <laughs> You really nice. have, to have uh, you have to have an agrarian economy to really develop music, I think. McLuhan also said, "Song is slowed down speech. The reason cultures have different musical tastes is ultimately connected to language difference." Any comment? I disagree. I feel like it's heightened speech, heightened yeah. human expression, not slow. Yeah, I mean, I've heard a lot of music that's way faster than speech, <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I disagree. Yeah, um, tell me an instrumental that, that makes you laugh. Laugh. Can't be, it can't be Spike Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I just heard something the other day that made me laugh with delight, and I'm trying to remember. Yes, it was um, uh, uh, a guitar. 
it was a guitarist I'd never heard of and whose name I don't remember, but somebody on Facebook had shared a video of uh, a jazz guitarist who played. So laughter, you know, is complicated. It, it didn't make me laugh because it was, f- well, it was kind of funny. He played this incredibly beautiful lyrical melodic solo. And at the very end, he, he hit a, a harmonic. And there was something so um exquisite so blime about that thing and it was so and it just struck me as so funny and i laughed out loud so there you go that's yeah. the most recent piece of instrumental music that made me laugh no, that that's beautiful because I, I mean especially me i'm such a name dropper and i asked this guy once uh who's your three favorite funk guitarists and he goes i don't know the guy who played behind joe tex and i yeah. goes it's so great you don't know his name because yeah, yeah. it's all this guy and i i want names and i was like <laughs> It made me happy to be without a name, you know. So that's like imagining. See, we can have something touch us our wise, and then we can just imagine how they made it. We don't have to know exactly how they made it, though you can go to books and tutorials and they'll say, this is how. So what what do you think, your hunch, what was the motive of the cave artist? You know, I've just been talking about how badly I want to see that uh, Werner Herzog movie again. I want to show my my twelve year old that movie. Did you see this this movie? He oh made, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, it's just. I usually it's funny you say that because I usually go, "What's the motive of the cave hours? Not what Herzog says in his movie or the yeah, New yeah, Yorker yeah. Article, or the New Yorker article he got. I, yeah. I don't even know if I agree with any of the things he right, said but, in the but movie. I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy for his movie. It's a great movie. Oh, yeah, it's it's a great, it's a service, and it's so. all all the per- people who pursued. Um, cave art and the anthropologists have studied it but i'm just going for yeah. like a hunch and it's wow. even the sad thing jonathan is we don't know cave music although he touches mm. on that a little he says here's a flute we don't yeah. maybe, we don't know cave dance we can imagine but we had to just have this one medium preserved yeah. this sort yeah. of like wow i'm very very moved by uh those cave paintings yeah there i they the 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 sensation of bridging this just unimaginable gap in time between one human and another and you know they're beautiful <laughs> there's there's such good paintings some of them like they're you know i was saying before there's no new ideas nobody's done anything better than that <laughs> um you know, many people have done beautiful, great things, but no, those are amazing. They're really beautiful. Like just as as color, form, line, um, representation, yes. even like they're really some of them are witty. Like the the yeah. way they paint uh, livestock is can be very witty and uh, evocative. So anyway, um, who knows? I it can't be that different because I don't think we're that different. Uh, yeah. we, we have technology um but i don't think that we've evolved in the technical yeah. sense since then so i'm gonna say it's probably the same kind of thing that that drives us now we want to say something and it can't be said uh, in language or do or or or, 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 if, or affect other people in a way that you can't do with words well it's so funny you said that because that's gary snyder said my task as a poet is Entail seeing the world without language, then putting that mm. seeing into language. Mm. Oh, that's that's really great. That's one of the best poetry things I've ever heard. Actually. Yeah, that, that is really good. But you touch on a lot of great things there. But before, I wanted to ask you: Do artists have a moral obligation, or songwriters? You, when I say artists, you know, novelists, artists, songwriters. I think, I, in a sense, I think that um, the obligation of an artist. Uh, even a popular artist, right, who's making uh, the next Marvel film or the next dance hit, is to, uh, it's like the constraint I asked for when I was doing covers. It has to be something you unironically love. I think that uh, an entertainment has to be heartfelt. I think that if you don't do that, you're an asshole. <laughs> I, I th- and I think even a sat- a parody can be heartfelt. I think that um, a silly comedy like the the Farrelly Brothers films, like there's something yeah. about Mary, can be extremely seriously made with a great deal of attention to detail and respect for the person you're making the movie for, even if that person 
just wants to laugh and forget about everything you you gotta put as much of your intention into that as possible that's that's how i feel well done a, a film teacher of mine said his mantra was ignore yourself jonas nika says there is no self-expression mm. Diesel mm. taylor the great jazz pianist said i'm just a vehicle and this just comes through me yeah so this question again it depends and it's and it's both but is art making songwriting more self-expression or more you're a vehicle for whatever culture or technology is dominant? But what is self? I mean, <laughs> um, how do you separate that? All you have is you. The only um, uh, machinery you have for creating the artwork is your, uh, your own um, uh, artistic programming, your life experience your memory um that that's all you, that is that's all you have so no matter yeah it, it does I, I kind of begin to understand what a person might mean by i'm just a vessel for this uh i get that but it's very much like the discussion of free will like y you only this is all you got and um when it's like I said, when it's going well, I feel like I'm searching for something that's there. Obviously, that's not true. I'm I'm making it, but it, it's a it's an unconscious process, and I'm generating and I'm generating and I'm generating. I'm searching, and then when I when I see it or hear it, okay, bam! I love, get that down. Let's let's remember that. Um, so that was good. Let's let's himself. Yeah, you know, uh, John um, John from negative lands that uh missy elliott learned how to sing from car alarms <laughs> so <laughs> you know it is interesting and you know ginger baker said How, how'd you get your drum sound he says i was in london when they were bombing yeah so right on. boom 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 it's like well go. okay yeah. but can art making be egoless can music making be egoless Yeah, I, like I said, I think in the act of writing, when it's going well, there's no ego. I'm not. I'm not thinking about how I'm going to be perceived or received. Yeah, um, I'm really searching for something because uh, m my body aches with the desire to find it. Like I have to do it. Yeah. Um, that's not ego. I don't think. I think that's yeah. that's a lot deeper. But of course, I, again, I have to acknowledge the second. Uh, even in that process, I can come out of that and be worried about what people think of me. Yeah, certainly when I publish it. But I, to me, the act of creating, yes, absolutely can be without ego. Yeah, there's no right or wrong answers to any of these questions. But Jonathan, that one you got right. And the one just previous, <laughs> the one previous is you answered a question with a question. That's where I go. You won. Oh, what, is what is self? Yeah. yeah, that is what is self. That was yeah. a great, great question. What's more important, conviction or compromise? Wow, I deal with that all the time in my job. Conviction? What's more important, conviction or compromise? Well, I'm going to flip it on you, and I'm going to say that um, what you're calling compromise, I actually might call collaboration. Yeah. Uh, and that you're if you're open to it, you're finding out something about the possibilities that you didn't already know. Uh, if you're working with a good person. <laughs> so there, I, I have not. Oh, that's great. Question. That's it. beautiful. Um, you, you, you help like, again, I'm, I'm always fond when people sort of reword the wording in, uh, it took 25 years before anyone said, what's more important conviction or compromise. And the guy goes, depends on what you mean by important. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of a joke do i do i have time to tell you a joke of course man. A, it, it takes a couple minutes but I'll, I'll get there okay so at a bus stop there are and i have to get them the order correct at a bus stop there are um an american a hindu man from india a russian and an israeli and up to them comes a pollster and the pollster approaches the american and says uh, excuse me what is your opinion on the beef shortage? And the American says, what's a shortage? And the guy moves on 
to the Hindu man and says, excuse me, what's your opinion of the beef shortage? And the, and the Hindu man says, uh, excuse me, please, what is beef? And he moves on to the Russian. And he says, excuse me, what is your opinion of the beef shortage? And the Russian guy says, what is opinion? Finally, he goes to the Israeli, excuse me, what is your opinion on the beef shortage? And the Israeli says, what is excuse me? <laughs> that is a good joke dude what is excuse me oh my god beautiful i really told, i've told that joke to israelis and they laugh so it's yeah. okay <laughs> okay PSL? oh wait wait um, no no here's uh, no you go ahead uh, um you've accomplished a lot in your life Rate these three elements. What's first, second, and third? Luck, skill, and ambition. What's the first, Lux. second? Luck's first. What's second? Skill or ambition? I don't think you can get skill without... Uh, skill. Uh, uh, I, I don't think of myself as ambitious, and I've accomplished a lot, right? Yeah. So I'm going to go with skill, but skill... In a sense, is related to luck because you got to be lucky enough to have been born with the the will yeah. to practice. Yeah, it's so. uh, Gary Player, the golfer, said, "The more you practice, the luckier you get." A hundred percent true. Yeah, but I did want to go to the wit thing because you brought up wit. I find your lyrics extremely witty. You know, you played with they might be giants. Those guys are witty. Yes, they are. What's the root? You know, in satire, you could talk about satire a little because Jonathan Swift compared satire to a mirror in which people could see every face but their own. And you also touched on something that Zappa does that I've observed and people don't realize it in general, is that he reverently satirized what he loved. Mm. He Reverently, well, you're describing that. Spinal Tap when you say that that, that movie yeah. was so impactful for that reason, yeah, yeah. Same, and it's also same. why I, I never liked any of Christopher Guest's other movies because I didn't feel like he loved dog show oh, people. And dude, I am this, I feel the same way. Oh, so cool. tell me the roots of you know, you getting into wit and just comedy. So, mm. are you growing up watching South Park or Simpsons or whatever? I'm older then, than that. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was Monty Python for me. It was and, Monty Python. And the early days of Saturday Night Live. And, and early Saturday Night yeah. Live, yeah. Monty yeah. Python, I think, was actually really... <laughs> sadly. Well, Monty Python, I had uh, albums that I would just burn through over and over again. They were Monty Python, George Carlin, Richard Pryor, Lenny Bruce... Um, all nice. of those things were really important to me. Dude, and my father uh, would read S.J. Perlman oh, and Ambrose yeah. Bierce. And yeah. so I was exposed to all those things. Um, but it was really my, in a sense, it was my father uh, himself uh, who uh, kind of, I, 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 wouldn't, I didn't quite model myself after him, but I, I feel like I have a similar sense of humor to him. Um, yeah, you they he applied it. You you had all these, but he was there live. And you know, That's I true. just interviewed all these same questions to George's uh Carlin's daughter, Kelly. And mm. do you know how many people don't take my suggestion? It's like there's no rush here, silence is okay. So before every question, you've sort of either closed your eyes or you you sense you center. But most people think they have to have a conversation, boom, 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 you know, like a media. And I'm asking a lot. I'm asking these big philosophical questions. You yeah. can just off the top of your head. But she would take a deep breath. Then she would crack up. <laughs> 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 and I would crack up. Then she would answer because she's like a Buddhist and a, a Jungian depth psychologist now oh, i don't know anything about her i've never even heard oh, of her. it's really fun and and she had to be a drug counselor at age 10 because her parents were druggies <laughs> so anyways yeah i see the roots of your comedy because i find it sophisticated too and when you said perlman and ambrose spears I, I i should i also have to acknowledge my mother and her side of the family my mother's mother was a songwriter uh yeah my mother was a lyricist um, and she also danced with the USO <laughs> yeah. in the, in the fifties. Yeah. Um, so, and, and she was a witty person as well and, and yeah. funny and charming. So certainly I, I have both of them, but the, the, the kind of 
dark or slightly more satirical bent of my work comes, I think, more from my dad. Yeah. And that leads right into this. You create what you resist. So I'm not saying you. One creates nope. what one resists. Bob Goldthwaite yes. morphed it into you are what you hate. <laughs> Joyce actually <laughs> Joyce actually said, it's a curious thing how your mind is super saturated with the religion in which you say you disbelieve. And Louis yeah. Bunuel nailed it. He said, thank God I'm an atheist. Just so <laughs> that sounds like the Marx Brothers. Okay, yeah, yeah. So just off the top of your head, I mean, what? How do you respond to this? What you resist persists. Oh, for sure. What you resist persists. Yeah. Or you create what you resist. Well, I mean, what 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 is there to resist other than the thing that you got that you don't want? You're you're yeah. making it. Um, yeah. Uh, am I still coming through clearly? Because I'm getting a warning that oh. my microphone appears to be noisy. Well, no, that just that pops up once in a while. You're okay, sweet. Um, yeah, I don't think I have a better answer. <laughs> yeah, anger can be a productive emotion when fill yeah. in the blank. Anger is a gift, is what um, uh, Rage Against the Machine said. It can be a productive emotion. Uh, yes, when there is either on a large scale or a small scale and injustice um it's a tool right it's a it, there when you become angry and it depends who you're talking to how effective it's going to be you are triggering something in someone else either fear or a realization of the seriousness of something to you um uh yeah so when the stakes are very high when it's life and death, when it's existential, when it's un when there's something deeply unfair, I think anger is appropriate. But unfortunately, it's not always going to work the way you want it to. <laughs> yeah. Very good, Jonathan. Really appreciate this. Moshe Fre Feldenkrais works with healing and movement. He says mm -hmm. it's literally possible to identify a weakness and incorporate it to become a strength. Rather than we're normally taught to overcome a weakness. Yes, absolutely. Tell me, a, tell me a weakness you turned into a strength. Mm, mm. There's so much more that I don't know about uh, being a manager and a tech lead than that I do. Um, and I believe that my willingness to be openly ignorant and vulnerable to an extent, uh, creates, uh, a psychologically safer environment for the people who report to me. So for me not to be om omniscient and, uh, to act like I have all the answers it also, by the way, generates a, a good space for collaboration when it's going well. So I think that uh, my ignorance is a source of, I don't want to say power, but effectiveness. Yeah, really well put. I appreciate that. I think the word vulnerable and empathy are the two words that just sort of glow in all this exploration with people talking these ideas is that it's like what is that <laughs> you know but you saying it and the way you explain it really felt good because you you're i mean in my opinion you're lucky you got a great boss because he's like dude <laughs> you know you you know what you're doing and so you know he's not um so tell me one major element that's changed in your creative process in any of your means uh suits in one major element that stayed the same my voice uh early on in the coverage project i uh went looking for a voice teacher because there was a there's one particular song coming up that i was really worried about i don't know if i can sing that um and came to uh reacquaint myself with someone who had been a friend in new york city her name is dina emerson and she is a great singer and creative person a theater person uh uh and it turns out like a profoundly great teacher for me like 
uh, and she doesn't take on too many students. I, I must have gotten her uh, at the right time <laughs> in the pandemic and and whatnot. But um, I treasure that relationship. And she gave me so I came to her because I was worried about uh, technical matters with my voice. Am I hitting the notes right? Like, do I have enough control over my voice to hit notes? But what I got out of the lessons are have nothing. I mean, certainly that gets better over time, but the stuff I got from her had nothing to do with that. Much more important, having to do with um, voice as a as a human expression, a tool of human expression. And there's, you know, vulnerability and not knowing. Like singing is, for me at least, is leaping off a cliff. Mm-hmm. It is the most exposed that I ever am when I'm singing. Um mm-hmm. And she gave me that. Like I, I already, I could already kind of like my voice hasn't actually changed that much, but my experience of singing has changed radically. So that's something that's changed a lot, and it's like, and probably is part of what opened up songwriting for me, because you got to, you know, these days you got to right. be able to sing your ideas. The thing that has stayed the same, I think, is an aesthetic. Um, I really treasure uh, the richness of the sound of popular music. I, I love production. Um, and I'm certainly kind of uh, programmed on a particular era of production, the 60s through the 70s. And I just yeah. love that sound so much. Um, and that I think will just always be a part of me. And, and as an instrumentalist, I bring that to my choices as a drummer. Like I'm a songwriter's drummer. I'm not a I'm not a flashy prog drummer, although I was in, when I was a teenager. But for me, it's all about Lee Von Helm and Ringo Starr and... Uh, nice jamie oldacre like you know those those guys yeah really well put is perception reality that's the kind of question that um sean carroll the physicist likes to deal with um no i don't think so i think there is such a thing as reality that is independent of um our perception uh however we only have access to perception <laughs> everything we do is mediated uh so for us kind of no but i i do like from a from a cold ivory tower philosophical perspective believe in such a thing as an objective reality how do you find peace of mind uh f- finishing a project feels real good finishing a song these days is is the most the greatest peace of mind i have beautiful can you forget to die no you can definitely forget to live wow that was a good cup these are five alan watts questions just off the top of your head uh Keep it brief. Who started it all? <laughs> Louis Armstrong. <laughs> oh, that is a. I got that answer about three weeks ago. I am so happy. That I don't actually. Great. I have to say, I don't actually mean that, but it's a good enough answer. Okay. No, it is a great answer. It's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. Are we going to make it? I don't know. Where do we put it? Uh, leave it right where it is. Well, I've never had that answer. That is a good answer, John. <laughs> Who's cleaning it up? I will. Beautiful. Is it serious? Yes. Wow, this is good. Well, we got a few more and then we'll bring Clinton in. If you were walking down the street today and you met yourself as a 12-year-old, what would you say to oh, your 12-year-old man. self? I would say the same thing that I want God to say to me. It's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. (laughs) Which way should toilet paper come off the roll? Over or under? Top. (laughs) (laughs) Why? (sighs) First of all, I'm going to appeal to authority and then I'll appeal to my own design sense. The authority (laughs) is in the patent for toilet paper. It shows it that way. Dude, I usually tell people that. That is amazing. You know that, really. Secondly, just let's look at it. uh, uh, (laughs) We are the design consultants on this. Well, let's see. (laughs) 
to, if it's under, you have to reach <laughs> under something. It's the place where it joins the roll is invisible to you. And although you can visualize where it might be, you still have to kind of work harder. Tearing it is more difficult when it's behind. When it's over, it is immediately apparent where that place is. Also, you can put your finger on the roll and hold it <laughs> while you tear, which is difficult to do when it's under. So there you go. You you are a massive. Thank you uh, so much for asking me that question. Oh, uh, well, usually if we were doing this in front of an audience, like 60 people, everybody sighs relief because I finally asked a, you know, like a normal question. <laughs> Anyways, really fun, Jonathan. No one's ever said that Pat thing to me. I'm really impressed. Um, <laughs> Tell me something good you never had and you never want. <laughs> so it has to be good. I've never had it and I don't want it. That's it. <laughs> I know my real answer, but I'm not going to say it. All right. Well, that's ESP because you, you won't believe what's coming up. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I'll I'll say what I was going to say. I just, I, if my kids see this, I don't want them to see this, but the answer is a threesome. Yeah. It, it, That's it, always it, the answer, right? Good. No, that isn't. You know what the, the, the answer is the most? Sex, I mean, not sex. The, the answer to the most is money, fame, and heroin. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I've never had heroin, but I, I'd probably try it. <laughs> okay. If you were in a vat of vomit up to your neck and someone threw a bag of shit at your face, what would you do? <laughs> you know, that reminds me of another joke, which is uh, a guy goes to hell and the devil who who's uh, his, um, you know, welcome committee is showing him around. He's like, well, you got a choice between these two places for the rest of time. Yeah. And he opens the first door. And it's a bunch of guys standing up to their hips and shit. Right. Um, and then, and the, and the guy and, and the guy's like, or, or you can go to this other place and it's people, um, you know, being burned and flayed alive and screaming. And he's like, Oh, I'll take the shit. And he goes in. And after 10 minutes, the, the, uh, the devil in charge says, okay, coffee breaks over everybody back on your heads. <laughs> that's a joke from like fifth grade um anyway what do i do i just take it like what am i gonna do <laughs> no that that's that what led to i love joke telling and i love anecdotes that led to the joke same joke the guy gets to hell the devil's at the gates of hell and he says um he can see they have high wi-fi you know internet on a, a good screen and everything and he goes you have the internet in hell? And they, the devil says, that's all we have. <laughs> <laughs> and you can feel real good. You can fill in the blank with everything. You've got Zoom in hell? That's yeah, all. That's all. Yeah, it's endless. You, you have books right. in hell? Yeah, so, for me, it would be sushi. You have sushi in hell? <laughs> that's all we have. That is good. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Fill in the blank joke. Yeah. 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 So, um, <laughs> it's a good joke. Yeah. We're almost there. Uh, Joseph Boy said, make the secrets productive. Lou, Lou Welsh said, guard the secrets, mm. but constantly reveal them. But Thornton Wilder said in 28, art is confession, art is the secret told. But art is not only the desire to tell one secret. It's the desire to tell it and hide it at the same time. Jonathan, I'm very grateful. You've laid your cards on the table for 90 minutes. I'm not implying you haven't answered this, but what's it really all about for you? I think that the process of uh, finding out that secret is uh, what draws me to it. It's not. It, it's less related to what I'm revealing to you as as a, a person experiencing my song. It's much more about the the uh, the process of finding out actually what is important to me. Yeah, it's good. Really good. What's important to you? The process. But to uh, elaborate on process, you don't mean the process of writing the song. Is I do. That what you mean? 
Yeah, you do yeah. The process of writing. Yeah, yeah the process of writing, and then of course, and then of course, singing is is a an adventure for me too. Like that's it's yeah. a real, it it's the most meaningful um, performance yeah. act I do these days. Yeah. Okay, well, Clinton's got something I know. He's a, a observant man. He actually listens and stuff. Thank you, Clinton. You're well, our... thank you guys. It's been a it's been a hell of a show. Awesome. It's been wonderful to listen in. Um, John Wheeler said the universe is ultimately reducible to information. It from bit. Yep. Yay or nay? Oh, definitely yay. Definitely yay. <laughs> uh, Shannon and Weaver's information uh, model of communication has been called the mother of all models. Uh, it's, it helps keep telephone lines sounding clear when it was first put into use in the 50s. Does it describe human communication? Only physically. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm familiar with information theory. I know what he means. And yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, wait, 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 let's let's take a step back. Maybe there's something about um, human communication. For example, we're talking to each other now, and I'm gesturing, and I'm my facial facial muscles are moving, and I'm making sound. Those are redundant in a sense. Um, uh, just like we use more bits to represent. Uh, numbers than we need to in order to do error checking on the other side so yeah let's say that it does apply to human communication in a loose way mm -hmm, mm -hmm. L well it, it's it's lower entropy that way i i suppose if we're applying the thermodynamic model to information <laughs> now is thermodynamics different from information or are they just d different scopes of uh of the same degree here well, thermodynamics I is what information theory is fighting in a sense like you are it's it's your war against uh entropy that's what information theory is so they i, I would say they're opposing thermodynamics wants to fuck up your information <laughs> <laughs> and information theory wants to get it across uh cyberneticist stafford beer um there's a chapter in his books from 1959 uh describing the use of black boxes um and there's a whole section in the chapter called uh completion from without and talks about the whole role of, of black boxes is to overcome uh well godel's incompleteness theorem or as i tell it to to jerry audrey lord's incompleteness theorem <laughs> because if you can't fix the master's house using the master's tools uh oh fair enough right yeah so you we're talking early on about wanting to uncover and visualize and understand what's going on inside of deep machine learning when it's applied yeah. to a do domain. Yeah. But back in the fifties, they were saying the whole point of a black box is that it's impossible to understand what's going on. And that's the benefit because it helps you complete mm. the model in the simulation. Mm. So are you trying to defy G Girdle's incompleteness theorem there with that proposition? No. While he said that you can't, uh, that given any sufficiently uh, expressive set of axioms and rules, you can't prove everything that's true. He did do so by talking about those tools. Like he did, he 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 went a level up. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, I I don't I don't think he I don't think that what he did spelled the ruin 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 of the tools but it spelled the ruin of one particular um course of uh ho hoped for course of action from the formalists but it's so it's so technical and i don't know that mm. it it really applies more broadly than that and it's i remember an analogy right it's an analogy to the incompleteness theorem when sure, it sure 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 but i think but if, if you're gonna bring it in it's like well uh I don't think so. <laughs> and it reminds me a little bit again of the question of free will, where it's like it's almost a distinction that doesn't matter. Like, even if I believe, as I do, that physics is essentially deterministic, it, it, it does not have any real change into how we conduct ourselves, how we feel, what we believe, how we go about our day. If you compliment me on the color of my shirt, I'm not going to say, you know, it was ever thus. It was meant to be. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I, I, I would say it's a, it's a distinction that doesn't actually say anything about uh, 
the way we we live. Mm-hmm. I I agree. Um, you made you made a point about the movie house. Um, Joyce preferring a real tree to a picture of of a tree and mm-hmm. your go-to point would by the way i think that, that's bull i think he's lying okay well for <laughs> sure for sure the, the way jerry asked the question though what yeah. got triggered in you what was this response that uh it's hard to have time for a reflection when you're in something when you're i think in so. a situation yeah. right yeah. so that immediately for me ties back to your your uh discussion about feeling exposed when singing mm. or or just pure extemporaneous being in action in a moment you're in it and mm. yet somehow you're doing the right thing because as a musician or as a singer you've trained yourself right so uh, yeah. yeah so is there a difference in in being between extemporaneous being in the now do you need to be um to have mm. self-reflection i uh, yeah I, th- I yes i think so i think that w- while you're <sighs> Well, all right. There's two two things I can say. One is that I got good enough at drumming that I could, while playing drums, uh, think about what I was doing and notice and observe and um, adjust. Wonder whether I put a quarter in the parking meter. Right? <laughs> I can't. I can't do that while I'm singing. While singing takes wow. every ounce of my attention, and I'm. And in fact, there are moments in drumming. I, I've I've often described uh, drumming slowly. If you're playing a slow song, you would not believe how much room there is between two notes in a in a slower song. Like da, 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 da. there is an ocean of time between each of those quarter notes. Ample opportunity to fuck up and and speed up or slow down or just make a mis- not a mistake, but just like screw up the groove. And singing is like that times 10, like every single microsecond of singing is, uh, uh, for me, it involves all of my consciousness. I, I don't think it's supposed to be that way. I think that you're supposed, to, when it's going well, you're in the emotional truth of what you're trying to get across, but I'm not there yet. I, I'm still like kind of figuring out physically what I'm doing, how to get the pitch right and all that stuff. So. Um, yeah, I don't. I think that in the moment, I, if I the second I do any of that stuff, any uh, any kind of reflection about it, I'm screwed. Like I can't. Mm-hmm. There's there is absolutely zero room for it. In, is in there moment. something generalizable about that outside of those specific domains? Let's say like having a conversation with someone at I, a bar. Uh, yeah, I I think so. So I guess my answer to that is what the actors always say, which is. Um, uh, if you're doing anything other than listening to the other person, you're probably not having a, a good conversation, right? If you're thinking mm-hmm. about what you're going to say next, then you're, you're yeah. missing what they're saying. That's, uh, that's what I would say. Mm-hmm. Well, I had notes and I've hit about, uh, ah, yeah, I'll call it a day. It, it's been fantastic, though. Uh, thanks Thank for uh, sticking hey. around for my little Jonathan, bit at the end here. Jonathan, I think your little intro on your website was really intriguing. The little illustration of, you know, what you used to oh. do, the pictures of the, uh, Cause I mean, Clinton is deep into knowing people, not knowing what the laptop is or the cell phone is. Mm-hmm. You are, uh, well, uh, I'm a Richard Stallman canoe zealot, I suppose in a nutshell. Oh. Right. So in that regard, mm-hmm. yeah. Insofar but, as but breaking you, the black boxes. Not, yeah, no, that was brilliant. Clint. I mean, Clinton usually does one or two and that was really good how you guys carried on and we, we should just do another mashup sometime where it's all three of us, but do you have a couple more minutes or you got to run, Jonathan? Because I'm really milking it here. But I, I, I had one more thing I'd love to bring up. But if you got to go. If it's, all- if it's truly just one more thing, I, I can certainly give you yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. You know, because Clint, you know, you know, Bob Dobbs, the, the fake Canadian Bob Dobbs came up with the Android meme. And it's basically that humans uh, invent things. Then they create s- hidden psychic effects. Then we end up imitating the hidden psychic effect of the invention and that's what the android meme is i mean is that basically that's sort of like we go i had a dream last night and it was like the movie so we use the movie to tell our dream so you know it's these hidden psych we don't know what the cell phone has done to us but we're already uh, uh, one more little example. I'm sorry, I'm being up to is um, 
people put their, they used to put their cell phones on vibrate. And then they would take the cell phone out of their pocket when they went to bed, put it on their bedside stand and feel phantom vibration. Yes. That's I've, on their I, leg. I've felt them so on that, my leg. I, I have done yeah, that. That's a, that's a puny example of the Android me. It's deeper than that. Sure. With like what movies have done to us, what zooms yes. have done to us. Yeah. yeah. Any, any reflection on that, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a famous, uh, a Star Trek episode, uh, that, that, uh, I'm sure at least one of you knows about where there's a, a culture where people only communicate in memes. Essentially, they the only their whole language is is based on a series of metaphors about things that happened in the past. Uh, and uh, there are there are these uh, trope phrases that they use to evoke. Tanagra. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So uh, we have that again, or we have that now in the form of what we now call memes which is rather a limited application of the word, which is like little pictorial, little moments from media with words on them, right? We we take the uh, situation of uh, uh, <laughs> Scotty in this in this Star Trek reboot, not want, or no, Star Trek in Mission Impossible, not wanting to do that, but also not wanting to do that. And we use that to describe the, the sense of the horns of a dilemma by using that picture of him doing that and putting the words there, right? So, uh, but not only do we do that, but I 100% believe the many of the people I hang out with, we develop that same shorthand where we really are talking that language. And and it even extends to uh, kind of signifiers uh, about tone, like uh, snark, irony. Those things are... Uh, almost background those are taken as a as a as a they're taken for granted as a an emotional tone for certain utterances in certain oh, yeah. circumstances yeah. even or maybe especially when we're talking about truly horrible things that are happening in the world you know if we're going to talk about war if we're going to talk about trump we're going to talk about this or that like there's a, a certain amount of snark that i think is 100 percent informed by that kind of media net and, and internet environment mm -hmm. yeah well let's continue this on the funny thing is bob dubs would say yeah, and then the Android memes are just talking to each other, and we've disappeared. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, they're back to yourself. What is self? That kind of you ties know. into my my answer, I think, also about evil, right? That yeah. we are just kind of hardware running this this terrible virus that, that causes <laughs> such misery. And and yeah. I think I think it's actually on a continuum with the kind of thing we're talking about here. Yeah. I, and I don't think it's it's bad. It's not. I don't think it's bad that we're influenced by or informed by those things. Um, I just think it's human. Yeah, it's and it's how we cope with them. Yeah, you don't make a value that's, judgment. That's that's what McLuhan said. Have suspended judgment. Don't make mm -hmm. a value judgment, and and cope. You know, yeah. it it's been such a pleasure, Jonathan. Likewise. Clinton, thank you so much. Really enlightening. Yeah. Thank you. Let's thank you very much. Let's do a magic.